Hello and welcome back to part two of our Best Races Ever podcast. I hope that you enjoyed the first half and without any further ado, we will crack on and jump straight back in at the number five position. So I've got plenty of things that I can say about this next race as we go into fifth. <laughs> yes, so fifth place. And I have plenty to say about this as well, as I do about all of these races and anything running related in general, really. I do love a good rant. Um, so fifth place is the 2009 world championship, 5,000 meters. And this is what I said to you earlier. This was one of the first races that I ever watched on the TV as a proper fan of athletics. So I started running properly. I started going to the running club in December, 2008. And this obviously took place in the summer of 2009. So I've been running for about a year and I kind of just started to find some real success and started to find some real kind of love for the sport and be was becoming more and more a fan of the sport. And this is one of the races that really cemented me as like a, no matter where my personal running goes, I will always be a fan of the sport, specifically distance running a 5,000 meter running in the sport. Exactly. And I think the other thing, and, and that's obviously your personal relationship with this race mm. and these championships, but the thing that's kind of stood out to me is that the importance of this tournament as the World Championships is fairly obvious, but this is at a time... No, it's definitely worth mentioning for but, sure. But this is, this is at a time, 2009 is significant obviously because a year beforehand, 2008, is when Usain Bolt really exploded onto the international scene with people that didn't know anything about athletics, having seen what he did in the Olympics. In the Beijing Olympics, yeah, with and the 100 metres celebrating early. And it, then exactly. And it, the two, yeah. it, it just redefined what people... I mean, I remember watching that race. And if we were doing best races of all time, obviously we've kept these to distance races. But if I were to do mm. my all-time best races that I've ever seen ever, that... 100 meter final for 2008 with Usain Bolt it will just be one of those lasting sporting memories that I will never ever get out of my mind it was that level of significance 100% um, but to, to then talk about this obviously Bolt was still in his prime at that point he then went on and set the 100 meter and 200 meter world record as part of these championships so the he national may have also, I think he might have also got the 4x100 uh, that might have since been I think um... it was since broken it's definitely been since broken. It might also, that performance may have been um, kind of DQ'd because there's I mean, so much stuff with drugs has gone on in sprinting, of especially course. for the relay. Like you don't know which relay results have been discounted and which ones haven't. Exactly, but we're um, not, we're not, we're not dwelling that, on that. Although for the time being, whilst I mentioned <laughs> we're on the subject of drugs, so we'll just, we'll talk about it now and then we'll drop it and we won't talk about it again. Oh, so briefly. <laughs> exactly. I, when compiling this list, wanted to keep it as much of a drug-free zone as possible. And that includes athletes that are under heavy suspicion of having, dope it, having doped or just enhanced performances in a way that you, Sam and I would consider not in the spirit of the sport. It so, tarnishes the legacy, as it were. Kind of, yeah. And other people may disagree with this, and that's fine. Like, I'm open to debate, like shoot me a message chuck us a comment whatever as we always say we're always open to discuss and debate these sorts of things but this is the reason and i do feel slightly guilty about it but this is the reason primarily why there haven't been a lot of women's performances included in this it's i can't deny that there is our audience and our preference towards what we find entertaining in athletics it does skew male and there's also a lot more history, which we addressed in our last podcast when we were talking about the top five performances of all time by males and females. There's a lot more history on the men's side just because of what, you know, males and females were allowed to do in terms of sports and competition throughout history. Not whether that's right or wrong. It's just the fact that the men's does have a much deeper and richer history. Um, and a lot of the best performances and races on the women's side of all time have been done under such a heavy cloud of doping and in recent times mechanical kind of i'll say mechanical doping with the vapor flies and things like that but even so those were good performances rather than good races and yeah it's just it's hard to hard to come up with much that doesn't have some kind of a cloud hanging over it do you know what i mean You've cleared your you've cleared your conscience there. I think that was important for you. Yeah. 
that's that's it. I've, I've cleared my conscience, and it's, yeah, there you go. Disclaimer over. <laughs> Back to the World Champs 5K. Anyway, yes. So like we were saying, so this was at a time where athletics was kind of... I, not to say that it was having its second win, so to speak, because obviously it has it, it's a hugely understandable and significant kind of pattern that these things go in. But yeah, it, no, was, but it, was, it was in the national it was on an attention. upswing. Yeah, it was yeah. on the upswing, yeah. Um, and then to look... <laughs> it's just crazy, just re- reading off the names because you just couldn't imagine them all on the same start line in, in this kind of context <laughs> anymore. Is In the 5,000 event, you had Kendo Sabikele... Bernard Legat and Elie Kipchoge, as well, well as Mo Farah. As I was about to say, Mo was in there, but he was just an also ran at that point. It, um, exactly. So to have these, you know, four as we now know them, absolute all stars appear on the same start line is is quite something. Oh, absolutely. And they were all they were in pretty much the prime of their career. Maybe Kipchoge was coming towards the end of his track career, but. That was as good as you'll see Legat over the 5,000 metres, as good as you'll see Bekele. Bekele wasn't, he was maybe a little coming towards the twilight, but he was certainly at pretty much his best in terms of racing. He was a little bit detached from his world records at this point. But yeah, Legat, and it just came down to the craziest race between Bekele and Legat. The the, I mean, the finish of that. We will we'll sort of we'll talk about the finish before we talk about the middle part of the races. There's not a lot sure. in it, even with what twenty meters to go. It's still pretty neck and neck. Yeah, and that's what I found so exciting watching that for the first time. I was like, "Who is going to win here?" Like, I had you just you would you didn't know until they crossed the line. Exactly. Like, Kaylee would pull in front, and then the gap would pull in front. And I think Kaylee. Even- with the commentary again, I don't know if it's a Steve Cram job, but um, he mm. says he says literally as they're coming down the home straight with probably 40, 50 metres left to go, he says it's, I think he says the speed of Legat versus the, he goes the 1500 speed of Legat versus, versus the 10,000 10, strength. strength of Bukele. And, and that's exactly what it was. Perfect. And Yep, and strength won it in the end. Bukele just about held off Legat. However, I mean, looking back, watching that race back, if Legat had positioned himself, because I think he had to go round Kipchoge with about 120 meters to go. Well, I Kip- think it was Kipchoge. Yeah, Kipchoge, I think, was in second. He was in second for the majority of the run. Yeah. Um, and it was only, I think, he, I think Kipchoge tried to go. I think they started to go at the bottom part of the bottom part of the bend. So you can imagine that's probably with what 150-ish, 200 ra- round there or thereabouts left to go. Um, and they were starting to really shift, and Kipchoge tried to go with it. Um, but mm. like you say, I think he and Bikele, of... Yeah, Bekele just got that little gap, and there was that daylight between him and Kipchoge, and Legat sat on Kipchoge's shoulder that he just got a little bit of a jump on Legat. And, I mean, Bernard Legat's the second fastest 1,500-meter runner of all time. He's run 326, for Christ's sake. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's got speed, but at that level, with the level of fatigue he would have had in his legs, like, if he'd just positioned himself in front of Kipchoge on Bekele's shoulder rather than on Kipchoge's shoulder, you can't help but think maybe Legat would have got him. Maybe he'd have, maybe he'd have had that extra meter, those extra couple of meters that he lost when Bekele got the jump on him. Yeah. And maybe it would have been a different result. But, I mean, that was just, it was an incredible race to watch. I mean, never before has neck and neck rang so true. Exactly. And again, if you put it into the context of a longer race, you expect when obviously we talk so much about sprinting ahead of this, when you watch a 200 meter race or a 100 meter race, you expect there to be those close finishers that have only got half a half a stride between them. But when you look at it over a longer race like that, to, to see it is, is incredible. And, and talking about the sort of the, the strategy in this, you have to remember that this is uh, Kennedy Sabakela had already run the 10,000 in he'd already run the 10,000 and he'd already run he'd already led a good amount of this race as well and he said we talk about the middle middle race and he knew he had to make this at least relatively hard to drop the gap because look at in his own right as a sub 13 minute 5k runner so he's clearly got the strength to go with it if it's a hard pace but if he had left it to it if they had say jogged around at 13 30 pace or so and left it to a pure kickers race I think Bekele thought, and I think a lot of people would probably agree, that Legat in the last 200 would have just been lethal and would have dusted everybody. So to have backed himself to have that game plan and to execute it the way that he did, which is, I mean, it's one of the hardest ways to win a race, is to do it from the front. Yeah. Um, 
but for him to think that he could do that, know that he could do that, and that was his best chance, and to actually pull it off and execute that plan and win the race, I think is pretty special. It's a lot of nerve. It is a lot yeah. of nerve. And to hold it together, like you say, and go and to, to know what he's already run, to know what he's got ahead of him, and to be able to just go out and hold the front line and just keep going, keep going, keep going, and go on to win, like you say, is something so incredibly special. So one of those real kind of historic moments when when the careers of these athletes uh, you know especially Bekele and Kipchoge who are obviously so forefront in the conversation at the moment when those are finally put to bed that will be one of those races that you go back on and when they're when they're both old boys and they're not doing anything apart from pe- appearing on the old promo that will be one of those <laughs> races that somebody on YouTube will get them sat down next to each other and t- get them to talk talk about 100% yeah no definitely I, it's, it's certainly one of the better races between between the two of them, not the best one though, uh, but we'll get to that later. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Go on then, what's next? All right, so that was number five. Fourth place on the list, we've got another world championship race, another Ethiopian. It is the 1993 world championship 10,000 meters featuring, well, actually, Legat is Kenyan born as well. He was representing the USA at the time. So it is Ethiopia versus Kenya in a way again. It was Gebra Selassie versus Paul Tanui. Now, this race was, what should we call it, dramatic, controversial, exciting, <laughs> I think all of you, the above. And, and you know what? The funny thing about it was, is it wasn't anything exceptional necessarily right up until, right up until the last bit, was it? Right up until well, the last lap. It was literally with, yeah, yeah, within 400 meters to go is when it suddenly kind of burst into life. I mean, it's, it was fairly standard of a 10,000 at the time. Uh, essentially, Gebra Selassie, who was the world record holder at the time, him and Paul Tanui got away from the rest of the field. Gebra Selassie was sitting, on to, sitting in behind Tanui. The pace had slowed pretty significantly to the point where the penultimate lap was a 69-second lap, which, for those of you who don't know, is only just inside 29-minute pace uh, for the 10K when these guys are... Gabriel Selassie's personal best is 26. Oh, man. I don't want to give the wrong number here. I think it's around 26, 19. Maybe it's slower. Either way, Gabriel Selassie, low, mid to low 26, this guy. Paul Tanui, not a huge amount slower. Gabriel Selassie's sitting on Tanui. And Salah, you haven't run in a track race. You'll have never had this happen to you before. But when you're running close behind somebody, or somebody's running close behind you at a pace that is slower than you're comfortable at. A lot of the time you'll kind of run into the back of each other and you'll clip their heels a little bit. Um, And this happened between these guys is Gabriel Selassie clipped the heels of Tanui and he, uh, he managed to do it somehow so badly that he pulled his shoe off a little bit. He pulled the back of his shoe off. I guess if you've got a spike there and it just catches in the wrong place. Yeah, just caught onto it and just pulled it off. Um, And that's when the drama started. (laughs) This was literally coming in just after a lap to go or just before a lap to go. Tanui throws his hands up in the air, turns around at Bekele and... uh, Sorry, at Bekele, at Gebra Selassie. He probably shouts something horrible at him. Kicks his shoe off into lane three. And I... I'm struggling to find the words to describe just how much he takes off. Like he just ignites the afterburner. <laughs> literally ignites the afterburner. It's, I, yeah, it's like he's literally just started a 400 meter race. It's, it's, somebody's it's almost... told, somebody's told him, right, you should probably start running now. And he's like, oh, geez, okay, yeah, yeah let's go. It's, do you know what? It's, it's almost got some degree of comedy value to it because it oh, just 100%. doesn't, it just doesn't look right. Like, obviously, you hear, you see his shoe fly off, and it's, I tell you what, you likened it earlier. It's almost cartoonish in what happens. It is almost <laughs> really Looney Tunish as to how, because he sort of bangs, he's so animated, he bangs on his head as if to say, I can't believe, you know, he goes, I'm out in front, in front of one of the best runners ever at the time. He goes, I can't believe he's looking, you've done this. He's looking good. He's, I can't believe, <laughs> nice Vine reference there. There you go. Uh, no, yeah, like it's look. He's looking good as well, and you can tell from the way he runs the last lap, he would have had a legitimate chance to beat Gebra Selassie that day. But 
And the reason he didn't However, beat him was because the afterburner was ignited with about 300 metres left to go. About 350, I'd say. It was kind of coming around the bend, maybe even 360, 370. Yeah, it was, yeah coming around the bend, just going into the last lap. But, but yeah, what an afterburner it was. Because he, <laughs> he goes. He goes. Yeah, I mean, he put a good... Appears. It was a good gap. I mean, you'd call it a winning gap in oh, definitely. almost any other race. It was good, yeah, 10, 15 metres, a good two or three seconds. And that gap didn't really start to close until, honestly, not really until the home straight. It was literally just the last 100 metres. If he had waited 50 metres to do it, then he might have won the race. And he might have won it quite convincingly. But Emotions got the better. The afterburners just ran out. He just ran out of gas just a little bit. It's like, you know in Formula One when they say the tyres get kind of worn out and they just fall off a cliff and you yeah. just can't drive the car anymore. Well, his tyre literally fell off. His tyre literally <laughs> fell off. <laughs> yeah. Well, it got, yeah, it got flattened and then he abandoned it. He just reached out and chucked it off. But, yeah, he um, he really ran out of gas there. <laughs> and Gabriel Selassie just sort of coasted by him to take the win. Um, the fantastic just, yeah. element of the of the drama, though, is as as to be expected. And I think I would react in exactly the same way. I won't sugarcoat it and say that I'd be a great sportsman about it. I would be fuming. oh, absolutely not. I'd have been furious. I, I, if anything, he actually showed some restraint. Exactly, yeah. Because you see, at the end of it, he goes to retrieve his lost shoe out in lane three. <laughs> and uh, Gabriel Slassi sort of comes up to him as if to say, well done. And you can see immediately that he puts his hand in his chest and no, 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 not from you. He literally has a shoe in his hand. He puts a shoe in his chest. You think it's got <laughs> spikes on it. I wouldn't be at all surprised when G- Gabriel Slassi got in the shower later that day if he had half a dozen little sort of uh, marks on his chest from where that shoe got thrust into him. Oh, yeah. No, he probably, he probably did. Like those spikes are no joke. Like pretty minor contact again with running into the back of somebody fairly minor contact will give you a good gash on your shin yeah if you run into the back of somebody uh, <laughs> i've got some i've got some like literal scars that are still on my shins from spikes i've actually got one on my quad somehow uh, amazing from a cross-country race yeah <laughs> not sure quite Slogging how that happened uh, <laughs> <laughs> no i think it was it was got- in the ncaa cross-country um either 2015 or 16 i want to say 16 and yeah i I know the guy who did it he was he ended up finishing really well that day he finished third or fourth or something it was putsam zena selassie who is a he's a sub 28 minute 10k guy so pretty pretty solid company that i maybe didn't have too much business running directly behind but (laughs) he's a tall bloke he's he's about six three six four and yeah he uh I got a nice taste of his 12 millimeter spikes in my thigh that day. <laughs> Had no idea what had happened until I finished the race. But yeah, anyway, back to back to Tanui and Gabriel Selassie. Yeah, I mean, if you're Tanui, like Jesus Christ, you want to? He's he's just stolen you. He had never won a world championship leading into this. We should say Gabriel Selassie had won a few. He was kind of the guy to be. He had already established fairly legendary status. And yeah, like he, I think he actually kept his cool quite well. Yeah, well, I dare say there were some colourful words said when he got back to the changing room. But yeah, but in, 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 the way that we can only look back on it now is that, ironically, had, I mean, had he have beaten Gabriel Selassie, he might have just been the one person to beat him. But because of that drama, maybe his legacy is actually, you know, albeit from a race that he didn't win, but maybe people will look back on him more fondly as a person who kind of got. I don't know. Got un- he just got bad luck that day. I think is a fair way to word it. Um, he did, yeah. Kn- no, he got very bad happened. luck. Um, but exactly. It's an well, Gabriel Selassie as legacy. well. Absolutely. And if we talk about Gabriel Selassie, he's had some pretty interesting races in his career. I wanted to kind of limit it to not making it all about one person, which is why we've only got you know we've got two from Gabriel Selassie and two from Bekele. Um, oh, actually, Bekele has three three in the end on this list. But, yeah, there's another race that stands out to me um, as one of Gabriel Selassie's most entertaining. And, again, it has quite a good bit of comedy value. Is I cannot remember the race or the competitor, but, essentially, Gabriel Selassie is about to out-sprint somebody coming down the last 100 metres of a race. There's maybe 20 metres to go, maybe even less than that, maybe 10. 
And the guy <laughs> sees that Gabriel Selassie is about to come past him, obviously isn't too happy about it. So just wallops him in the back of the head <laughs> and sends him absolutely flying over the finish. If anything, this propels Gabriel Selassie even further <laughs> forward than he was already going to be and just throws him over the line. But <laughs> imagine that. Somebody's going to beat you and just like, well, I'm not happy about this. Well, all right, I'll just get a quick dig in and punch you in the back of the head. <laughs> So oh, if anyone dear. knows what race that's from, I'd love to watch it again. So chuck us, chuck us a comment or something. Oh dear. Go on then. Let's move forward because we are now in. We've been we've been recording this now for an hour and a half. We're on, we're on your ninety minutes, so we'll give you the Ooh. benefit of the doubt and uh, and round off the last three. But let's yes. do let's do the last three. So this last so this this third place is one that we've sort of teased a little bit. You've mentioned it in passing by mentioning that obviously Emily recommended it. You said that you were there to witness it yourself. And it holds a special spot because we found it as the most entertaining women's race that we yes. uh, that we could think of. So, and the only women's race we should mention to make this list. Um, I, again, really would love to be proved wrong and for there to be, for somebody to show me a women's race that's worthy of this list. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to be proved wrong because lo- I wish we had had more mention of women's races on this list. But we'll stick with this one because... I mean, geez, if we were going to have a women's race, what a race. And again, what with, a race. With, my, with my key words that I've written on my notes here, drama is the one that's underlined here because, again, I didn't, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I didn't know this race. As with a lot of these races, I didn't know this one. And I watched it before we sort of got everything set up today. And I was, I was sort of aghast at everything that was going on and what I was going to say to you, but I said I'll it deliberately was cra- It was a crazy, crazy race. Quickly, before you go with what you were going to say, we should just um, specify for a oh, yeah, we haven't actually talked about it already. <laughs> it is the 2017 World Championship race in London, and it is the 3,000 metre steeplechase. All right, go. So what I was going to liken it to is, you know, when you go to an art gallery and you find a painting that you really like, and no matter where you look in that painting, there's lots of little extra bits going on that you didn't there's spot always, beforehand. Yeah, you just the longer you look at it and the more times you watch this race and the longer you look at the painting, yeah, the more stuff you start to notice. It's just, I've never watched a race where there's just so many, like literally just like, moving parts. It, it, it's unbelievable <laughs> to watch. and. I don't know a huge amount about the steeplechase, but the one thing that I do know is that obviously it's a longer distance race with hurdles injected into it and a water jump as well, which, I mean, I don't know the distance between the deepest part of a water pit and the top of a steeplechase hurdle, but I'd imagine it's probably about five foot, six foot. It's quite a a drop, isn't it? Um, Yeah, maybe more than that. I mean, those pits are deeper than you think. If you If you jumped directly downwards from the top of the barrier into the deepest part of the pool, which I wouldn't recommend doing if you try to run a quick steeple, but yeah, you have quite a drop on your hands. Um, so, so yeah, so with a the steeplechase, there's naturally going to be a lot of stuff to consider and, a, and and it's those mental things you've got to work out as you go along. I've never run a steeplechase, yes. but I can respect that it's one of those things you've got to know how you're going to jump and know exactly when and where you're going to jump and and to talk about when and where you're going to jump let's talk about the very first lap of this race because i couldn't believe that this happened that you've got this world class (laughs) on a world championship level exactly on a world championship level and the thing is when you watch this race because you can do this on youtube like we said all the commentators in the build-up to this everything they say before the gun goes off is this is the best field ever assembled there's so many good runners in here oh my goodness, this is the best field of women's steeplechasers you could ever hope to see together. So, yep. the, And if anything, by saying that, they were probably downplaying just how good that field was. Like, like it was incredible. Like you've got, and I think they said all the fastest times in the world were there. I think they'd said that you'd had... Yep, well, a lot of the fastest times in history. Uh, the world record holder was in that race, which we won't, we'll say... Uh, yeah, well, we just, it's Ruth Jabet who we've talked about on this podcast before for doping. She's been currently banned for serving a, a doping suspension. But at the time, we didn't know that. And, but she, yeah. inject, she injected a lot of drama, but not immediately, because the most immediate no. thing that happened with this is that, and for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> this is one thing that I do know about steeplechasing, is that where you have the water jump is 
you can't have that obviously in the middle of the track so they have a sort no. of, they have a sort of a cutaway of the of the track and you often see this on a things that sort of it, it cuts away and you have to kind of run inside the loop of the track and that's where it's always, that yeah it's always either on the inside or the outside of the track and it's yeah it's never obviously in the middle of the track unless somebody wants to build a track that's specifically for only steeplechase <laughs> which would be to be fair that would be kind of cool to see it would so be they cool. can start and they can get because it's hard to get splits for the 3000 steeplechase i know roughly the 2k is just after the back the barrier on the back stretch the second barrier on the back straight but, but um but yeah that's the, beside the, the point the athletes literally after a lap in let's be honest an olympic stadium i know it's obviously five years removed but this is still mm. a world famous olympic isn't it you know, it's well, not, I, I mean i was there i can testify to the fact that it was pretty packed you know it's a it's a pretty significant stadium that you should have been able to do your homework on and i dare say some of them have probably <laughs> really run on the thing a lot um, but they don't know mm. where they're going and they literally i think about four or five of them initially go to split off as if they were going to go round the track without going through it and they only realize as the people next to them start to go in the opposite direction um, yeah and, this... and i have no idea how that happened because these are all like you say they're the best runners in the world and i think maybe it was not that there was that many of them that didn't know they were supposed to cut in and go to the jump i think one of them and it was probably the one who ended up running wide i think was it jeb cost guy yeah, I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, it was, yeah, i think it was I the i think it was the yet was it the youngster who ran wide i can't remember her name um um, either way, it, it was one of the Kenyan runners. Um, yeah, she just ran around the outside. No and so much, reason. so much so, because I dare say, had she run around the outside without doing anything, she'd have been disqualified. So she actually yes. has to loop back around and probably ends up running what another maybe 10 15 meters by the time she's completed this if she runs past it then runs it, back. it may have even been longer i mean she stops dead turns around runs back runs back past the barrier so she can have a run up into the water jump barrier like she doesn't just run to the barrier hop over it and she runs back past it she must have run yeah an extra 50 meters at least it's craziness and yeah she's miles off the back it's craziness. So she Absolutely gets so, miles off. So she gets over it, and then they continue the run. And fair play to her. And I think strategically, she probably did the right thing because then, almost immediately after all this had happened, uh, you know, maybe a couple of hundred meters down the you know, down the track, is I think there was a there was a fall, and I think about three or four people all got caught up in it. So that group, yeah, that, no, it was a big fall. That group kind of almost gets cut in half straight away. Um, so, so like I say, it's just so much going on is that you've just had this person <laughs> not know where the hell they're going. Then you've had this fall that's taken half the field out. Meanwhile, the girl that had to go round the water jump has now put the gas down to then catch up with the running, the lead She's group. She's clawing well. people in. And do you know what? I think that fall probably helped her. I think you're right. Like, to absolutely no end because it gave her some closer targets to aim at. Just pick that one off, pick that one off. All right, she's still laying on the floor. Pick her off. <laughs> but mean, meanwhile, like you say, um. Jabet, who was leading the race at that point, she wasn't going slow either. She was really pouring it on. Yeah, I mean, they were going around about just outside nine minute pace, I think. I think their first kilometer split was around about nine oh uh, three oh one, three oh two, something like that. Yeah, it was it was fairly it was fairly quick, I think. So she was mm. really up the up the front. The pace was really being pushed, and um and in the end, like we say, I can't remember the name, but the the girl that had had to go around and do all the work then somehow manages to really grit her teeth and get back up in that lead pack yeah and am i <laughs> maybe you didn't maybe you noticed it better than i did but whenever i've watched this race and i've watched it a couple of times since obviously seeing it live she kind of comes out of nowhere like i have no idea how she did that <laughs> yeah no i agree like, to I agree. this day i will never know how she went from being 50 meters off the back of the group plus to then being back in that leading group but I think it's, <laughs> again, I think this is all to do with because there's probably so much, you know, you're trying to work out who's recovered from the fall and you're trying to work out if they're going to go around at a world record pace or what's going on. There's so much going on that all of a sudden, by the time you sort of reset your eyes to what looks like a normal race, it's, um, yeah, you just like, someone oh, else oh, she's changed. back. Okay. Yeah, yeah so, exactly. <laughs> so then I think it's fair to say that after that, a decent amount of the race then starts to go kind of, more what you'd expect again more back to normal um because it's more it's pretty similar to what you described um which is typical of a marathon race earlier 
of there was that lead group and it was yeah it was about five or six of them or so and it just slowly whittled down like you'd lose one runner then the next lap you'd lose another then you'd lose another and you'd lose another until it came to that final lap and I think it might have been just before or just after the la- the bell for the last lap that Jabet started falling off. Yeah, I've got it uh, here that she uh, da, 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 where have I got it? She falls she falls off on the last lap. I've got. I said there's basically it was on the last lap. There's a group of, there's a group of five of them all left with um with the with the on the last lap and then as they roll round to about I think two hundred meters I've got on my notes here. Yeah, they're coming down. Yeah, that's it. Off. She falls off down the back straight. Yep, that's it. So she falls off down the back straight, and you've got the two Americans, Emma Coburn and Courtney Frerix, and then you've got two Kenyans. Is that right? Yep. With Jabet, who is I think Bahrainian. I, who cares anyway? She's drugs cheap. Um, she then falls off, and one of those two Kenyans that is in there is the youngster who is, I think, what did they say, like 18, something 18, like that? Yeah, yeah. And then the other one is the one that fell over earlier in the race. Just, again, there's so many moving parts going on here. Uh, and It's crazy. And then as you come round to the final bend, again, this is as you'd expect with a dramatic races kind of thing, There's there, it's still close, but... As oh, actually, <laughs> just quick rewinding a little bit quickly. On. At some point down the back straight, Courtney Frericks of America takes the lead, which at the time to me, I was like, what the hell? Because <laughs> I had seen her running like the NCAA cross country and stuff. She ran for the University of New Mexico and like she was pretty good. She, I think she set the NCAA record in the steeple. So like, I obviously knew who she was as a collegiate athlete about the same age. But seeing her leading the world championships, I was like, what? How? Like, what is going on here? So that was that was kind of a cool moment. Anyway, carry on. But yeah, like we say, as as we come round to the to the last hundred meters or hundred and fifty meters or so, oh, we've it, got to talk about the last water jump. I can't even remember what happened. Go on, what happened? So right, so with about two hundred meters to go, one of the Kenyans takes off, which kind of backdoors the other one. Yeah, and the two Americans, Frerichs and Coburn, are kind of with it, but there's maybe a little bit of daylight opens there. And I know in my mind, I was thinking, oh, here we go again. Like the Kenyan in the steeplechase is going to go take the gold. Yeah. But the way that this, those two Americans attacked that last water jump was unreal. Emma Coburn, especially, she won the race on that last water jump. Like the ground that she made up and then surpassed on the other two during over that last water jump was insane. And I'm pretty sure it was an inside pass that she made to make that move. Okay, Which, I don't. I didn't remember that because I was clearly so bowled over by everything. <laughs> everything else. Was going yeah, well, on. it was like you say. There's so many moving parts that you missed probably one of the best tactical moves in any steeplechase ever, male or female. Um, yeah, she did that, and that's then she just sort of maintained until the line. Um, managed to sprint away for the goals, and then USA went one two with Ferrex in second, which I think she wouldn't be offended to hear is one of the biggest surprises i've ever seen in a world championship uh well in any event in athletics. so this these are these are a few things that i uh that i then pulled back uh or i pulled off the commentary here is they then said that this was the first usa medal in this event not like women's not anything the first usa medal in this event for wait for it for 65 years and they got a one world they got a one two um, I think, yeah, I, I suppose in the world championships, yeah, because I know Evan Jager medaled in the men's steeplechase um, in 2016 in Rio in the Olympics. Um, I'm sure he's got a world championship medal as well. Uh, maybe, well, I'm, I'm pulling off what they said in the commentary, so I haven't fact-checked it. Yeah. It's important for me to say. Um, but also, I think they said, uh, is it Ferrex you pronounced the lady who came second? Ferrex, yeah. Yeah, she, she ran a 16-second PB. <laughs> so, it's unreal isn't show, it? shows you the form that they were on shows you how much sugar they had in their coffee before they came out yeah okay so jager was um the male who was also american who was medaled at world championship so he came second in rio and he was third in that championship so if we assume that the women's final was before the men's final that was probably you're probably right with your little fact there yeah um unbelievable but like i say that to to watch that race, having not known much about steeplechase and not knowing 
really anything about it to, to watch that race and just to see it unfold bit by bit by bit it was I was hooked on watching it it was just crazy it's just crazy to see it all flying off at once so an absolutely brilliant choice I think to have have up in that third spot absolutely very deserving of the of the bronze medal in this steadfast greatest races of all time podcast <laughs> But go on then. Let's, let's 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 talk let's talk legacy races now let's talk, let's All talk right. silver you want to give out the silver medal do you go on then i'll give it out Ooh, go on go on tell us tell us about it wind the clock back 2003 so this is a hell of a long time ago now i think this is geez 17 years ago now yeah, it doesn't feel like it at all. <laughs> but again, we've got these athletes that we've already mentioned half a dozen times. We've got Kipchoge and we've got Bekele, as well as El Garouge, who is obviously so significant from being a 1,500-meter performer and having a mile world record, you know, just on the table as well, casually. Why not? Why would Yeah, El Garouge is certainly no slouch. I'm pretty sure he's he ran so, significantly sub-13 for the 5,000, so it's not like he was just a jumped up 1500 meter runner that was way out of his depth. He won. So he's won world titles. I think he might've even won the Olympics in um, Athens in the 5,000. So literally the year after this, but I may be wrong there. But anyway, so we're looking what at what a showdown, but yeah, we're looking at, we're looking at these runners who we know performed well. And this is, and we talk about Kipchoge now, obviously in such massive high regards because of what he's achieved in the marathon this is yeah this this is when he was a relative unknown he was 18 years old in this race 18 years old and i think they had they'd they'd clocked him as one of the fastest in the world at the time for the year but yeah well i think he was the current world junior champion um either over cross country or over 5,000 meters or maybe even both but either way he was a world junior champion and to become world junior champion generally you, that means that you are competitive on the world stage at a senior level anyway. Exactly. So we knew that, like, they knew that he was a hell of a runner, but I mean, he's racing against the 5,000 meter and 10,000 meter world record holder and the 1,500 and mile world record holder. You wouldn't think that he'd factor against El Garouge and Bekele both in their prime. It's a daunting kind of prospect, isn't it? You are stood. It really you are, is. You are stood looking at the bottom of a massive staircase and you've, you, <laughs> you've, you've got to decide how you're going to take that first step. So Absolutely. the race gets going. And to be fair, as far as just a race goes, it's just one of those it's just kind of one of those good races to watch. Like it doesn't become obvious who's going to win. You have enough kind of people dropped off that, you know, there's some, you know, there's some movement. Like is there's just enough going on that makes it a good race wherever you join, I think is fair to Definitely. say. And there's an interesting tactical element to this one as well, because you've obviously got the strength versus speed, like we talked about earlier. And it's Bekele on the strength side again. With, he must hate it with these 1500 meter runners coming up and trying to run, trying to run the 5000 against him. Yeah. Because Bekele's gone to the front and he's pushed the pace because he knows, again, if he leaves, if he's, if El Garouge is anywhere near him with fresh legs, with uh, anything from eight to eight, El Garouge did kick from relatively far out for a 1500 meter runner. He would like to wind it up from six, 700 meters out. But if El Garouge's legs were fresh enough to start winding with a couple of laps to go, Bekele knew he didn't stand a chance. Like, 326 speed versus, I can't remember what Bekele's PB was for the 1500, but I don't think it was under 330. No, you know it's going to be be pretty sharp, don't you? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's going to be quick. And he probably was capable of running sub 330 back when he was closing out 10Ks and 52. Um, But, Either way, Bukele pushing the pace. He's the strength man. And a couple of times in the early stages, you do see Kipchoge just sort of drift to the front. And if you didn't know who any of these guys... If you were watching... Not if you didn't know who these guys were, sorry. If you were watching this in 2003, you'd think, who's this guy? Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Like, what's, what's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> and, and if we sort of fast forward a little bit as the race really starts to get hot... You do again. You see these big moves being made, but even with a lap left, there's still sort of you know five or six of them left in the tank, basically. And you mm. really start to see some drama and some fireworks fly because as they come through the bell, like I said, there's about five of them. And like we've said beforehand a couple of times, is it just gets a little bit quicker, a little bit hotter. One person drops off, and I think there's two Kenyans behind 
this group this group of three running up the front um I don't know if I'm not sure if they're killings. I think they are, but um, but you sort of you see them. I, I, I actually can't remember. It's like this race. It's but they're so having, focused on those first three. Exactly, but they're they're having their own little battle, and then one of them drops off, and meanwhile, El Garouge is going like you see him with like sort of two three hundred sort of in left to go. You see him really, and obviously he's such a tall figure as well. And he's got those big long mm. strides, and you see him. Start he's to put he's a somebody that's on. almost it's intimidating to watch him when he's sprinting. Yeah. Like, yeah. it's one of those people where you look at him and you think, God, I wish I could run like that. <laughs> and he's got that determination. Um, but then I think mm. it's as they come around that final bend, that's just what that's just what electrifies it. Um, is that you kind of you see them all come around that final bend, and you think you've got Morocco, you've got Kenya, you've got Ethiopia, you've got those African nations that have just been famed for running, and as they come, and around, they're just going at it they're taking lumps out of each other it's, and uh, the thing that's fantastic about it is they all they're spaced enough where they all if you i'm, I'm actually just brought it up on my screen now um and i'm just watching watching the finish in slow motion um is they all end up in um, individual lanes they go literally lane one two and three as they come around that bend who and, out of interest who is in which lane uh el garouge is in lane one kipchoge two uh Bekele three so it's kind of if you imagine them coming around it's that width again about yeah who's trying to hang on to that inside line the best and it is so 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 close and as you're getting to the as you get into the what, last 10 meters you sort of see kipchoge just hold his form together a little yeah, bit yeah he just inches ahead doesn't he and uh, yeah at some point the, i think the commentator makes the bold early call there and it's like kipchoge wins it and yeah you're like, what it's it, i think it's just so entertaining to watch because you really see all of them hurting in their own individual way you start to 100%. see you see something that's very really uncharacteristic of the kipchoge that we now know which is his head is rocking all over the place and he's oh he's visibly hurting yeah 100 <laughs> percent. his form starting to get you can tell he's just holding on to that last shred of form what i was going to say is did i send you the link a link to that video was it obvious who won in the title? Or did it say so, like Kipchoge 2003? Or did you watch that race not knowing who won? Um, I had watched that race previous um, to the beforehand. Ah. But there is no... But I had watched it before not knowing who was going to win. Because the link that you sent me is probably the same one that I watched. It's got a million and a half views. So it's bound to be the one that anyone finds. Mm. Um, but it is, it is incredible. It's a tremendous thing to watch. Yeah, w- watching that without knowing who's going to win. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, again it's one of those ones just if you, insane if you printed it if you printed off the screenshot of the last 200 meters you said right here's one and then you did another one in five meters five meters five meters like that. if you just printed off those frames and said who's gonna win i mean it's still anybody's business isn't it right up to the finish oh absolutely and i think now as well it, history has been very very kind to this race because if you said right these three are going to run a 5000 it's going to be a decent pace but not crazy and it's going to come down to a big kick who's going to win i don't think many would say kipchoge no. <laughs> let's be honest um, if you're doing a fantasy 5000 most people are going to pick bekele or el Garouge. exactly and and like you say and this is a i think this is the last point that we should round off before we get to number 1 is yes is that it's just so cool because you've now got in the space of let's be honest a couple of meters by the finish You've got the 1500 meter, the mile, the 5000 meter, the 10,000. Well, hang, hang on, hang on. Go on let's go do on. them in. Let's do them in the appropriate order. Let's get. Then. Let's mention Kipchoge first. Okay. You've oh, got right. oh, I see finishing that. in first place. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing. You've it, got yeah. the world record holder in the marathon, the first man to ever run sub two hours for the marathon. Then finishing second place, you've got the fastest 1500 meter and mile runner of all time. And then in third place, in the 5,000, you have the 5,000-meter world record holder who also holds the record in the 10,000. Like, those and track just records... about everything else going as well. Exactly, yeah. I mean, he was the Olympic champion at that... Oh, no, no, maybe he wasn't. Either way, like, he was... He was Bekele. Boss. He was certainly the 10,000-meter champion from those world champions. On that race, crazy, just a crazy, crazy race, and I don't think, I don't think we'll ever get a race like that again with names of that magnitude 
all going head to head that go on to have the careers that those guys had. Yeah, it is a history sweet spot in terms of athletics, isn't it? It really is. And to be honest, if we had taken absolutely no outside, if it had been just me on my own, no outside influences, I'd have put that as number one. Oh, yeah. But it's not. It's not our number one. What is our number one? Who's the gold medalist? Well, anyone who's savvy will have worked this out already. But it's a race they that will have. It's it's a it's a race that we talked about in such high regard in our last pod, and it's a race that I just find myself talking about and watching a lot. It's it's just because it's literally the best race of all time. It is. <laughs> it is just such a. And it's I, official. I, we've we've branded it as that now. It's and I think the thing is, I think it's important to mention this from other aspects. So from a performance standpoint, it's excellent. From everybody else who ran in it, the people that didn't win, it's still excellent. Um, and and from a race, I think it's pretty excellent as well. Tactical. Yeah. It in terms of like what was happening with positions moving around and things like that. We should probably mention if you've not figured out already it is the 2012 olympic race over 800 meters where david rudisha just obliterated everyone and the world record and ran one minute 40 seconds for 800 which is just absolutely unthinkable but yeah it's exactly like we said in the last podcast the way he just dominated and the way he ran that race with just perfect splits from the front no pacemaker I, I, to be honest, I don't really have much to say about it because it just speaks for itself. I know. Well, the point I was going to make just before we go off on on why we like it so much, and and well, obviously we can do that so quickly because it's because of what it is and how how good it all is. But I was going to say, and this is something yeah, I said and how you, much we've discussed it already as well. Yeah, it's something I'll say to to all of our listeners. But I said this to you earlier: is that it's the perfect sweet spot to watch as well. There's a lot 800 meters, yeah. There's 800 a, meters is a very watchable race. And I think the reason that it's so good is if we compare it to the other races, you compare it to a 10 second, 100 meters, it's over. Bang, it's over as soon as it starts. It's really easy to just you know, walk out the room and then come back and go, how'd you get on? Oh no, you missed it. Whereas at least with this, it's <laughs> it's it's two minutes. It's long enough. That, it's engaging. That you know it can start and you can say, oh, come on, the race has started and you can call somebody in. When you watch mm. a 400 meters, everyone goes round and they stay in their lanes. So it's, and because of how a stagger works, obviously on a track, it's sometimes hard to tell who's going to win until it comes right down to the last straight. But Absolutely. With, yeah. Unless it's, unless it's very, very clear. If it's a close race, it's hard to tell who, yeah, who is in the lead. But, but with an 800, obviously you get that perfect blend of everybody on their own sort of start lane. So you get, everyone gets their own focus on the camera. Then there's a pack where it all looks like a longer distance race, but then you've got the advantage. It's only, you know, just over a minute and a half long. So you don't have to watch because what, let's be honest, a lot of people that don't like running or don't get running, go, I get bored. And if you said, mm. oh, come watch a 10,000 meter for 25, 26, 27 minutes, they're going to go, oh, do I have to? It sounds like a long time. Whereas <laughs> two minutes, everyone's you know what, two I do, minutes. Those people... Do you know what? Those people, I don't want to know because in my opinion, <laughs> 10,000 metres is the most interesting race to watch on the track. It's a good if race to watch. you properly engage and you know what's going on with the... You don't even really need to go know what's going on. Just be observant of the different moves that people make. If you're getting splits given to you and there's good commentary if you're watching it on TV or you've got a knowledgeable crowd around you if you're watching it live. I think the 10,000 and Highgate approved this with their event, like the 10,000 PBs. Yeah. 10,000 meters, most interesting race on the track. Ran over, carry on about release. Go on. I was just going to say that is, if you're a stranger to it, if you struggle to watch athletics or if you don't find that engaged in it, but you love the Olympics or something like that, this is one of those absolutely perfect events to watch. So, twin, absolutely. twin a perfect, very watchable event with. The performance that Rudisha put in that, like you said, we don't need to talk a huge amount about, but the confidence and the aggression that he went out and just ran that race is is something oh, unbelievable. It is, it is just ridiculous. I mean, I, I'm i struggling to think of anything new to say about it that we haven't already said in our previous podcast, well, to be I th honest. I think the only the only other few things that is always good to watch is, is obviously there's a screenshot where it cuts in on his face, I think with probably about two or 300 left to go, and you see his absolute determination. Um, yes, yeah, to, I remember we spoke about that last that time. His eyes days. are just so focused. And yeah. then you go and you cut to obviously people like Nigel Amos, who I think came second in that race, the Botswana runner. And yes. um, 
he if you want to see somebody who pulls some funny faces at the end of a race he's the person to go and watch because... well actually if you want to see somebody really die at the end of the race as well it's amos oh, man what i can't remember which diamond league it was but it was at some point last year in 2019 it was the last diamond league before the world championship amos went out hard and he was on world record pace for a long long time but watch he came down the home straight and honestly i've never seen anybody look like they've been in so much pain running down the home straight as him in that race and donovan brazier from the u.s actually ended up coming past him in the home straight and running it might have been an american record i'm not I, sure I whether he, he ran it the in american record he I'm does sure. have the american record but i race, can't yeah. remember whether he got it there or whether he got it when he won the world championships later on in the year but either way that that was a brilliant race and i think that's all I really have to say about Rudisha, no. I mean, well, she's very you know, deserving of the gold medal here, of, exactly. the, of the title of the greatest race of all time. And and you know what? I'm gonna. I'm, I know the perfect way to bookend this is because we can Go admit because we can admit that we have no idea what the hell we're talking about and that we completely contradicted ourselves and that we're massive hypocrites because do you remember right at the start of this podcast we said that just because just because it's not the quickest race of all time that doesn't mean it's you know it doesn't mean that it's a good or a bad race but what yeah. we've done we've, we've chosen our favorite race ever with an absolutely ballistic world record with a world record yeah no i know <laughs> but either way i don't think any of the other hold on no yeah none of the other ones on this apart from obviously mike boyd running the fastest mile of all uh, any human ever None of these other ones were world record. These were mostly championship style races. In fact, they were all championship races except the Great North Run. Yeah, so um, we've, we've just used the world record as a little cherry on the top of our, well, of our yeah, first Yeah, nice place little cherry race. on the top. The last thing, so that's the greatest races of all time. But let's. I want to prompt any listeners to tell us what your greatest race of all time is. And I want us to offer ours up as well. And um, we can talk about entertainment value, performance, or a combo of the two. I know you don't have quite as vast of a um, a pond to fish from as I do, but I mean, yours I think is quite an obvious decision as well. And we'll see if we're on the same page here. But I think your five minute mile is probably one of the better entertainment value races that I could think of. Oh, I, as as far as an achievement for me, it's still one of my proudest, most like uh, do you know what every now and again i go back and i think about what i actually did and i go yeah that was pretty cool so yeah i, lo- I love that yeah. i love as, as a personal achievement i loved it it's definitely my running achievements until i finally do finish the marathon we won't talk about it but as <laughs> when i do finish that will probably crown it no matter regardless of my time but up until that point yeah it's got to be my uh my sub 100 percent. and you know what i don't think this. I don't know that you'd be able to make a marathon video or run a marathon race, regardless of whether there's footage of it that beats that project five video. <laughs> Check it out on YouTube guys. Just go to Sam Wade's YouTube channel. You'll be able to find it pretty easily. It's one of the more watched views out there, uh, more watched videos on his channel and just follow the journey that we go on. This, you were the first, that was the first time I'd ever coached. Anyone was coaching you for 10 weeks to see if you could break five in the mile we documented the whole thing before the before training, during training, and then the mile time trial in the horrible piss and rain. And yeah, I mean, it was just amazing. Go on then, very quickly. What would you what would you say your would you say that you've got a crowning race, uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll close off after that. Yeah, so I have I have a few. Uh, I've got a choice of three that I'm going to give the listener, and they're all on YouTube. Or is it two of them that are on YouTube? No, no, three of them that are all on YouTube. I have a fourth that is somewhere deep lost in the archives of FlowTrack. And that's annoyingly probably the best sprint I've ever produced at the end of a race. They're all fairly fairly close races. So my honorable mention in fourth place was the IC4A three indoor 3,000 meter championships in, I think it was 2000. It was so long ago, I can't even remember. I think it was 2015. Maybe it was 2016 where I won on a pretty nifty kick. I ran 26 for the last 200, which I've never done before or since in my life. So very proud of that. It was a good race. It was a close race as well. I won the race by less than a second. Nice. Um, Now I'll give you a race that I actually lost. 
and you can find all of the next three of these on Mark Hookway's YouTube channel. Um, yeah, if you do, if you go on his channel and you search for the name of the race, which I'll give you, um, and the year, it should be fairly easy to find if you want to give him a watch. If not, then I'm just rambling for no reason. So the one that I actually lost, it was the Watford Elite 3000, which is kind of an invitational that Mark put together. People who haven't listened to Mark's podcast, give it a listen. In fact, all three, no, two of the three are Hookway organised races. Um, so yeah, this is one that he put together, just invited a bunch of the best runners in the country over to Watford to run a fast 3,000 metres, the 3,000 metre time trial race. And yeah, the, the pace was good. The pace was quick. People were kind of shifting around in the pack. And with 600 metres to go, a guy called Richard Allen absolutely takes off. And I find myself being the only one that's kind of willing to chase him. So I go after him and he's got a couple of meters on me and then I've got a couple of meters on the rest of the group, which is a fairly, uh, not a dense group, but there's three or four guys that are in kind of in contention. And it kind of carries on like this all the way up until about 200 to go when I start reeling Richard Allen in. And the group is fairly split up by this point, but there's still a good couple of them that are kind of in contention. So I start reeling him in, it comes to the home straight and I kind of pull up on his shoulder and he puts in a little bit of a response. I put in a little bit of a response. And then from absolutely out of nowhere, Luke Trainer comes flying past. <laughs> people may know who people may know who Luke Trainer is. If not, like he's, he's a very good runner um, who is unfortunately serving a doping suspense right now for a not a performance enhancing substance. <laughs> Um, just for being a bit of a silly boy, I don't think you'll mind me saying. Okay, but yeah, he comes absolutely. No, well, it's not politics. He just was a bit silly on a night out, um, and it came back to bite him in the ass. Um, yeah, he comes absolutely flying past, wins the race. This just completely undoes me because I cannot believe that someone has just done this. Like, just come from absolutely nowhere. So I buckle a little bit and just sort of stumble my way into third. Rich hands up, hangs on for second and we all ran massive pbs so yeah it's one of the most entertaining races i've been a part of quickly another one uh bmc 5000 meters at watford again in 2018 i won the 5000 meter race pretty much just from tucking in behind the pacemaker initially and then just ramping the pace up and up and up and up similar to what we discussed just slowly dropping different members of the field with 100 meters to go somebody tries to come around me and I just wasn't having any of it and just took off, ended up winning the race. Last one is another, like I say, the uh, uh, Mark Hookway race that he organized at the Tombridge Twilight Invitational. That was last year in the 3,000 meters again, because we love a good 3,000 meters. Apparently, that's my best distance. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I mean, these races are all good entertainment value races. I'd stick them in the top 10, to be honest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was turned into a fairly tactical race. A uh, guy who I know in a race against a few times, Jack Gray, ended up being the one to kind of take the pace on and try and ramp it up over the last couple of laps. So I thought to myself, I mean, if I'm, if I'm going to beat him, I'm probably not going to run away from him. I'm probably going to need to save this for a last second sprint. So made sure I was kind of in as close a contact as possible for him and just took off with 150 meters to go and... Yeah, ended up winning that race. So there it is. Those are my most exciting races. We want to hear from your you guys as well, the listeners. If you've got links to YouTube or if you've got a good racing story of the most exciting races you've seen or been a part of and ran yourself, let us know. Do it. And also we can get in touch with you oh, you can get in touch with us via the instagram uh, via any any of the socials that obviously kieran is in charge of running so please do that we'd love to hear from you as always um, but do you know kieran we've said this you said 90 minutes we've just clocked over the two hours and nine minute mark so we're coming up to two hours and ten <laughs> so oh wow so yeah, you we'll know what this is this, this is definitely ended up in two halves again so well done to anybody who said in your, <laughs> said in your mind of course that went into two halves well done um <laughs> anyway I'll close this one off again. So 
thanks again for everyone for listening i hope that you've enjoyed that list it was again it was a lot of fun compiling them and watching them and i will do my best to include all of those links in the description um certainly the youtube video i'll see if spotify lets me link that much information in the bottom um, but there will be a way to see them all so thanks again i hope you've enjoyed this i hope that you guys stay safe do remember to stay home and do everything that you can to help those around you by not going out and, uh, and doing too much crazy stuff in these times of need and i guess we will have to get on the phone again sometime kieran and record another one of these yes absolutely uh we'll try and come up with a bit more of a neutral subject so it's not two hours of me just ranting and raving <laughs> about my favorite races again like i absolutely love this stuff like i had a lot of fun making this but yeah, and again, if anyone has any suggestions, let us know. Uh, maybe we'll try and get ourselves a little interview or something hooked up. But yeah, until then, like Sam says, stay safe, stay, practice social distancing. And once again, guys, do not eat bats. <laughs> Thanks again, everyone. See you soon. Cheers, guys. <laughs>